Welcome to FaithBridge Sermons Podcast. Today's sermon features high school pastor Tyler Riley, and it was recorded on Sunday, April 3rd. Thanks for tuning in. We'd love the chance to connect with you, so drop us a line at podcast at faithbridge.org. And if you're in the area, join us this Sunday on campus at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. and come say hi. And you can always join us for FaithBridge online at faithbridge.org slash live. Here's Tyler. Well, good morning. Good to see y'all. Uh, to everyone who's here in person in our live venue and then also online and in the communion venue as well. Good to be with you guys this morning. I want to start by telling you my, really the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me. That's a, it seems like a great way to start. Uh, in fact, this may be the worst thing that ever happened to me. But it all started, like most stories do, with the time that I bought a live chicken for $3. (laughs) It was uh, at this lumber store called Sutherland's in the heart of Columbus, Texas. And uh, I I walk into this lumber store with a couple of my friends, and I see, like, these live chickens on kind of on display. And I, like, growing up where I grew up, off the Gulf of Mexico, chicken parenting isn't like a common practice, like farming. And, uh, and so I thought it was a petting zoo. I was like, this is cool. And the guy was like, no, you can, you, they're for sale. It's like, you're selling the animals from the petting zoo. That's incredible. <laughs> and, and he's like, no, like you can, you can, you buy them. Like people can leave with one of these. I'm like, I give you U.S. currency, $3. And then you give me a live chicken. He's like, yes, that's exactly right. And I was like, man, I love this country. (laughs) And I'll take one. And so I did. And uh, in my mind, I was like, look, first off, this is a business decision, right? A meal at Chick-fil-A, $7. (laughs) This guy's three. This is what's called a long-term investment, okay? Like my shares in Carnival Cruises. It's going to pay off one day. (laughs) And so I take this guy home, and I name him Tyson, See, in, your la- in my mind, it meant son of Ty. That's how that translated. But I see where I messed up. And uh, I take him to my place of work because I'm like, this is going to be hilarious. Like, I'm going to have a pet chicken. Like, this is awesome. This is great Instagram content. And I put him down in the middle of the office. Uh, I-, I brought him to work. I put him down in the middle of the office, and I take a step back, and I'm proud of it. And I'm like, check it out. And it's dead silent in the room except for one guy. Uh, I won't call him out, but his name's Colton, if you're watching. And uh, he said, eight days. I was like, what? what? He's like, you won't keep that alive for eight days. It's like, not only will I keep it alive for eight days, I'll keep it alive for the rest of my life, dude, okay? This is my best friend, first off. Watch your mouth around him. And would you believe it? On day seven, the day of completion, uh, I get a phone call from my landlord. And when your landlord calls, it's not to talk about like the game last night, right? Something's happening. Something's going down. So I I call him back because at that point I was taking part in a training with our staff called Speed of Trust, which is incredibly ironic. And I call him back and I'm like, hey, sorry, I missed your call. He goes, hey, I just, you know, the neighbors called me and told me the fire department's at your house. I just want to make sure everybody's okay. It's going where you think it's going, by the way. And uh, I, I was like, of course we're okay. Nobody's at home. And I was like, oh, Tyson. <laughs> so here's the deal. If you, if you do ever get into uh, chicken parenting, there's a thing required called a heating lamp. Don't look at me different. <laughs> and what happened was that the scientific terminology for what took place is that it fr- freaking exploded. And it caught the laundry room on fire, along with all of its contents. Rotisserie chicken. (laughs) And it caught the house that I was renting, renting. I am not a homeowner. I told you, I have shares in Carnival Cruises. I do not own a home. I'm renting this house. And it catches on fire. 
And I walk inside to see the damage, which first off, I had to make my way through all of my neighbors who were standing in a a big gossip circle in my yard holding hands, talking about me. And I pass a firefighter who's coming out and he's like, we had a fatality. And I'm like, you're the worst, man. And I walk... And I, you know, I walk inside to assess the damage and it is phenomenal. Like it's, it's insane. Like it is all up in smoke. And in this moment, like if you're putting yourself in my shoes, like this is a very heavy moment. Like, oh my goodness, like this home that I'm renting, I, it, it caught on fire. And my landlord was surprisingly very gracious about it. And he was like, look, man, this, these things happen. And I wasn't going to argue with him, but I was like, man, no, they do not. Like, this, these things do not happen. Uh, but he, he said, hey, if you can, you know, repair this laundry room, that was the big area of focus. If you can repair this laundry room and make it look great, you know, to me, you've, you've you know, fixed the, the problem. I'm like, okay, great. Uh, at this time, to make it even more heavy, I have accepted officially a job at Faithbridge Church. That's right. It was not that long ago. Uh, they did not ask me about it in the interview, so I did not have to say anything. Uh, but I am, I'm working at Faithbridge during the day, and then I'm leaving and driving an hour and 45 minutes to Columbus to do repairs on this house till it gets dark, because we don't have electricity anymore. And, and then I'm driving back right after that, and I'm doing that every single day for about a week. And it comes down to the final day that I need to have this done, And I'm like, honestly, there's too much still left to do. I don't think I'm going to get this done. And I don't know what happens. And I was terrified. And then I pull up into the driveway of the house, and there's a bunch of cars there. I'm like, this is odd. And I walk inside, and all of my friends, all the people that I was working with, who I was leaving for another job, are inside with paintbrushes and tools, and they're fixing uh, the rest of the damage. And we were able to finish it and complete it right as the sun went down. And I cannot tell you enough, like when I handed those keys over to my landlord, that was the most tangible weight off of my shoulders that I've ever felt. And it's odd, it's kind of interesting. When I recount that story and when I remember it, I really don't remember the events of everything that happened as much as I do the people who showed up to help me, the friends who came through. And people's responses can make a profound impact on us, right? When friends do something incredible for us and they step up and they come through, it it makes a big impact on us. But here's the reality in that same vein. When friends maybe don't come through and when friends actually downright hurt us or wound us, or even betray us, that makes a big impact too. And this morning, we're gonna talk about how do we navigate being wounded by a a close friend? Because this is a reality of something that's gonna happen, right? I think we put a lot of effort and anxiety even into trying to prevent bad things from happening to us, specifically when it comes to other people, trying to keep ourselves from being hurt by other people. But wouldn't you agree that if you knew something was going to happen, despite your best efforts, then your efforts would better serve you in figuring out what your response is going to be when it does take place, because it's going to take place. You can't control it and keep it from happening, but you can control your response to it. And your response not only impacts and makes an impact on the other party, it does with you as well. And so I think this is an important topic. It's a tough topic, but it's, a, but it's an important topic as well. And Jesus actually gives us in the passage that we're in this morning, as we continue in the story of Jesus, he gives us two interactions with two close friends who have wounded him, hurt him, downright betrayed him. And we're going to look at his response because this morning, as we're looking at this topic of when friends wound us, we're going to look at kind of the ground view Right? There's a lot of, of steps that you can talk about uh, of going and, and talking to the person and things like that. Those are all great. I want to start at the foundation. I want to start at the ground level. Where do we start? How do we process that? And then how do we act? What is the first step maybe that we need to take? 
So we're going to be in Luke chapter 22 this morning. So if you got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, you can just put a hand in the air and we will get a Bible to you. Uh, and actually, that's our gift to you. You can take that home with you. Uh, if anybody says otherwise and they're under 5'8", let me know and I'll take care of it. Uh, Luke chapter 22, we're going to be starting in verse 47. It says this, while he was still speaking, there came a crowd and the man called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Right there already, that, that's a message in and of itself. The compassion of Christ is unbelievable. If I'm in that situation and I'm being taken captive and you guys are with me and, and one of you cuts off someone's ear with a sword, I'll, I'll say like, whoa, 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 stop. And then I'll be like, what are you doing? Like aim lower, right? Christ's compassion, especially to people that are against him, is unbelievable. I can't fathom that compassion. Going on, verse 52, it says, Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour in the power of darkness. And then they seized him and led him away, bring him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. This is the point in the story in the accounts of Jesus where uh, Scott talked to this last week about Jesus choosing to bear the cup, right? Choosing to drink the cup of God's wrath on sin and taking that on himself. This is the point in the story where now he is beginning that figurative and quite literal walk to the cross to do that, to take on that cup. And this is the moment where the betrayal occurs that leads to that process beginning. And we're going to look at two interactions here. That's it, two. And we're going to look at Christ's response to this, right? If we're looking at uh, how do we navigate when friends wound us, and we are seeking to follow Christ, it would be important to look at Christ's response to a situation like that. So the first interaction, and you may have known we were going here, is with Judas. Right? This may be the uh, most popular act of betrayal in Scripture. And who is Judas? Judas is, it says, one of the twelve. Right? He's one of the twelve disciples. He's a close friend of Jesus. He's one of the twelve that Jesus chose to be a part of his inner circle. And in a moment of, of greed, and in a moment of, of desiring self-gain, Judas, his close friend, one of the 12 that Jesus chose, very literally sells Jesus' freedom and his life in exchange for money. Sells him to the people who had been trying to capture him. And in this moment, what is Jesus' response? Well, I'd say his response is trust. 
And you may be like, Tyler, that doesn't even make sense. Like, how, why would he trust again the guy who just betrayed him? I'm not talking about a trust in Judas. I'm talking about a trust in the Father, and specifically the will of the Father that he spent all of this time in the garden right before this praying over and saying, Lord, is this what you want me to do? And knowing full well, this is what needs to take place so that humanity that doesn't deserve it can be offered redemption and reconciliation with the God who created them. He has trust in that will of the Father. He even says, verse 63, when I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour. Now here's the thing. I just said Jesus can see, right, where the will of the Father is going. For us, the hard part is that we don't see what comes next, right? In a moment where we're wounded, even downright betrayed by somebody close to us, we often don't see the full picture. But my question is, above all else, do we have a trust in the Father? (laughs) A trust in the Father that this will not always be this way. A trust in the Father that he has a will and a plan and a purpose for your life. That's a hard thing to do in that moment. And here's what I'll say. A common phrase that we hear a lot is God is good. Right? We grow up hearing that God is good. I think the problem with that is that we associate that phrase, that terminology, when things are working in our favor. When we receive things that are good. Right, when we, we receive the blessing that we didn't deserve or we receive this kind thing from the Lord, and man, God is good. And that's true. My question to you is, is God still good when that thing doesn't happen? For me, in 2017, when, when Ken found me in the middle of a carnival in the place that I was working at, uh, I was, very bluntly, I was in the worst place of my entire life. I was on stage doing skits and making people laugh, but I was in the worst place of my life. See, I I had just really fully moved there and and thought, man, this is what I'm gonna do for a long time. I'm gonna raise a family here. And I was actually with the person that I thought I was gonna raise that family with. And in the matter of a summer, that relationship was over. And that place actually told me, hey, we feel like you've reached your ceiling here as the funny guy. I felt like there was something more. I I wanted to do more, but they didn't quite see it. I had everything was just completely gone (laughs) in a moment. And every morning, all I could do, because the the pain was so much, in in the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's, Audrey Hepburn says this line where she talks about, uh, you know, the blues. She says, you know, the blues are just associated with sadness, you know, when it's raining all the time. But the mean reds, the mean reds are, are far worse. And I was like, that's, that's where I'm at. I had a belief that maybe one day it would get better, but I couldn't see that happening. And every morning I would get a cup of coffee and I would walk around my neighborhood. And my prayer looked like this. God, this hurts. I'm hurting. This hurts. That's all I could say. And in the moments that I felt the most peace, it seemed like the only time I would feel a glimpse of peace is when my heart got to a place of trust in the truth that God is good. And my one day won't look like it does today. And one day I'll look back and say, this moment got me to that moment. And friends, I am in that moment. God is good now and he was good then. The trust comes when we get our hearts and our mindset to a place that goes from what if, what if this happens? Well, what if this happens? Well, what if this happens to a place of even if? Even if this happens. Even if I lose it all, I know you're still good. I trust you. What if is anxiety? Even if is a peace. 
What if grips for control, even if relinquishes it to a, a worthy beneficiary? So my question to you is, is your heart in a place of trust where it says even if? And then the second interaction we see is with Peter. Also a popular one. Peter is also one of the 12, a very close friend. And Peter has an incredibly weak moment where he actually betrays Jesus. He denies that he even knows him three times. And what I want you to do for a moment is I want you to picture yourself in Jesus' shoes. Oftentimes we'll look at this passage and we'll put ourselves in Peter's place, which is great. I want you to put yourself in Jesus' place in that moment. You see, this is, this is one of his disciples. This is a close friend. Do you know that before this, Peter unprompted actually says to Jesus, I will follow you to prison and even to death. And then there's this chance. And through immense pressure and, and the heat of the moment, he denies that he even knows Christ to escape that. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in Jesus' shoes? It says he was right there, sitting in chains when this is taking place. He turns and he looks at Peter. You know what his response is? Grace. Well, how? Well, again, put yourself in Jesus' shoes. What would you do in that moment? I know what I would do in that moment because I've done it on a much smaller scale, but I've done it. Allow me to explain. It is circa 2009, the year of our Lord. <laughs> Shut it. And, and I am uh, at... I'm at camp, right, with my student ministry and my student pastor, Kevin, who's been a huge influence on my life. And I'm there with some of my close friends. For the sake of the story, we'll call them uh, Tim, Jeremy, Tyler, and Kassan, because that was their names. Um, <laughs> and we're there, and we're interacting with Kevin, our student pastor, and he reveals to us that a security detail for the week is going to be uh, served by the student pastors from all over Texas. They're going to be on a rotation of making sure everybody's where they're supposed to be and there's no problems. So then we, of course, are like, just so you know, you would never find us if we wanted you not to. And he said something to the extent of like, well, yeah, I would. So green light. <laughs> we began <laughs> unhatching the most evil plan in existence. So what we did when it came time for power groups which is what they called Bible study to make it not sound as boring to high schoolers. We skipped that and instead took a box of zebra cakes and a Gatorade to split between the six of us for survival. And then we went into the woods on the other side of the lake and we waited. My friend Tim, was, he had red hair and he was wearing a neon green Spurs jersey, which I didn't even know they made those. And now looking back on it, it was a pretty poor decision, Tim. Um, but we just sit there and we watch and behind the main office, we see a golf cart pull out. And we're like, it's happening. This is our moment. And then another pulls out until four golf carts are now on the search for six senior boys from Baytown, Texas. And we're like, oh no, we've gone too far this time. This is the time we did that. And all of a sudden, we look to the right, and there's this huge cloud of dust billowing up. And with that cloud of dust comes a, a fleet of four golf carts with targets acquired. So we were caught, and in that moment, we did what anybody else would do. We ran. We took off running as fast as we could. And I was not vertically challenged at that point in my life, but I was, challenged, or, or I was gifted, rather. I was vertically challenged. Um, we don't have to talk about that right now. But... Um, I was very gifted in the miles per hour category. I used to be really fast. Used to be. And um, I, as we're running, right, we have this grand idea. We don't even talk about it, but all of us have the same idea. They've seen what we're wearing. Even though we know, like, they just took roll. 
they know it's us and they're literally in the walkie talkie like Tyler stop running and I'm like if we if we change our clothes we will blend into our surroundings and we can go to power group safely so we begin as we're running down the final stretch of the hill starting that process unbeknownst to us one youth group from East Texas has decided that that's a great time to have uh, all of the girls in the student ministry go through a, a true love weight seminar. And we didn't know that was happening. That's not our fault. <laughs> but we're sprinting. I get into the cabin first. I change first. And they're like, dude, go ahead, leave us. I'm like, I'm not leaving you guys. I would never do that. And they're like, go ahead, leave us. And I was like, you got it, man. And I walk out. <laughs> and as soon as I walk out, the golf carts like peel in. And, uh, and they're like, you tell us where your friends are. I was like, Baytown boys move in silence. Like, I'm not telling you anything. <laughs> and, and then they were like, we'll call, we're going to call your mom. I was like, right this way, gentlemen. Let us go see them. <laughs> and like, <laughs> like, I'll greet them with a holy kiss so that you know which ones they are. And we go inside the cabin, flip the light on. And to my surprise, all of my friends are in their bunks. And they're all waking up for the first time, <laughs> like rubbing their eyes and they're like, oh no, did we miss power groups? <laughs> Today was Proverbs. And in that moment, I was like, oh no, 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 no. They're with me. We did this together. This was a Baytown Boys collaboration. I did not do this alone. They did this with me, even though I, Ju like I had just betrayed them like they betrayed me you can't do that and I took them down with me and that night we actually had to give an apology in front of the entire camp for our actions and say that we understand that student pastors aren't paid incredibly well <laughs> it's funny because then I, I I'm doing that now and <laughs> three of us are actually and uh and we had to apologize in front of the entire camp I had an opportunity to bring them down, and that was the first thing that I did, right? And that's a mild situation. There's been a, a lot of other times that have uh, cut much deeper, right? But here's the thing. It does not get any deeper than what Jesus is sitting in in this moment, where he has been betrayed, and not once, now twice, where Peter's denied that he even knows him. So how is his response grace? You know what Jesus does in this moment that he has his opportunity? He has him, right? The prime opportunity that we can only hope to be in. If I'm going down and I'm sitting here in chains, no, 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 you don't get to deny me. Remember what you said? You would follow me to death, to prison, to all of it. Here's your chance. Here's who he is. You know what he does? Nothing. Nothing. Do you realize how powerful that is? Sometimes the most powerful response we can give in a situation that happens like that is a response of grace. And the grace to hold our actions. Even when we have the power and the ability to quote unquote, give them what they deserve. <laughs> So for us this morning, I would be remiss if I didn't remind us of where Jesus is going. He's starting this walk to bear this cup, but where does it lead? It leads to a death on the cross. He's actually going to have one more <laughs> turn his back to him. And it's the Father. Scott said last week, when he takes on that cup and drinks of that cup that was meant for us, he's going to be separated from his Father for the first time in existence. Do you know why that needed to happen? <laughs> Here's why that needed to happen. Do you know there's, there's something actually that God cannot do in his holiness? He cannot act contrary to his own character. 
He cannot act contrary to his own holiness. God is loving. God is merciful. God is also just. God is a God of justice. And justice is that you receive the sentence that you deserve and then you fulfill that sentence. And scripture is clear that the sentence, the wages, the punishment of our sin is death, eternal separation from the one who created us. And scripture is also clear that there is none that is righteous, not one who is without sin. That means, guess what? That is all of our sentences. And it's fair, right? If God says, hey, I created you in my image, love me and obey my commands. And we say, no thanks, and choose sin. The the punishment is just, it's fair. That that God would then say, okay, well, depart from me, I never knew you. And I think when we think of the gospel, we often think that God just dismissed our sins. Oh no, justice had to be paid. It just wasn't paid by us. In his great love and in his great mercy, Jesus took that cup that was meant for us willingly. He could have stopped all of this from happening. And then he willingly laid his life down, took on the wrath of God that was meant for us in our place. So that for those who, who, who know him and who confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and that he had the authority to forgive our sins and he offered us that forgiveness by what he did on the cross, that is where our salvation comes from. Looking at this, at this teaching and, and building this sermon, it was a great reminder for me of how thankful I am that my salvation does not depend on how I respond. I'm glad it doesn't. God gave us a second chance. And not a second chance in the way of, okay, you get to try again now. What good would that do? (laughs) We would be right back where we started. We're not capable of doing it. But instead, a clean slate, a record wiped clean, the judge coming off of his stand and fulfilling the sentence that was meant for a, a very worthy, a very worthy sinner. And when I say worthy, I mean worthy of fulfilling the sentence that we were supposed to fill. <laughs> so this morning, I, I, would, I would hope, and I would pray, and I would plead, and I, I, I would beg of you, <laughs> to know this Jesus who gave us that. And you can know him. You can be close to God through what Jesus accomplished. When he said it is finished and he hung his head, it says the curtain, the veil, which was the very tangible separation between God and man was torn in two. That wasn't a coincidence. That means because of Jesus and only because of Jesus, not a thing that we can do because of him paying that punishment we can be close to God again and we can step into an eternity in the presence of God. When our eternity was hopeless. So this morning as we worship, I want us to worship in a response. That's what worship is. It is a response. And I want us to worship in a response of gratefulness. In a response of undeserved freedom. Freedom. Whatever comes to your mind, worship out of that response this morning. Let me pray for us. Let's do that together. God, I say this all the time, but thank you doesn't even seem adequate. I don't even know how to start a a conversation with you like this, where I'm going to thank you for for what you did on the cross. But God, just sitting in this moment, thinking about what you did to 
offer redemption and reconciliation between you and a sinful creation of whom I am a part of. I can't even, I can't even fathom. I can't even fathom it. It's hard to even comprehend sometimes, but God, you have given us You have given us a way for our sentence to be fulfilled on our behalf. We have new life in that. So God, thank you that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, willingly took on that cup. God, may we show half the amount of grace even a fraction of the amount of grace that you showed us to other people. So God, you're good in all times. We pray all this in your name. Amen.